Hello, everyone. Hello. Sure, getting, uh, getting audio connected here and uh, checking in. We'll wait a, a couple minutes here before we have a few more that may be joining us uh, before our call starts. But uh, right, uh, appreciate y'all being with us and uh, look forward to interviewing a few of our members that are involved in some of the medical community uh, around us. And this will be an opportunity for us to, to chat with some of them, find out some answers about how things are going for them personally, but also one at a time to pray over uh, our medical professionals because we appreciate all that they're doing uh, in so many ways. And so uh, we have, I think, a few more that are coming into the room uh, right here. We'll get started in just a moment. All right. Any, any jokes? <laughs> yeah, anybody got a joke to start off? <laughs> any medical jokes y'all have? <laughs> oh, I'm sure I have plenty. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the ones out of uh, my world that are appropriate to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good place to start, actually, would be to think about out of your world, what each of your unique professions are and all that. Um, again, welcome if you've uh, just joined us. Um, we've got uh, Wes, who's co-hosting and kind of moderating the room. And so if you want to check in on that chat uh, option at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat option to pull up a box and you can follow along there. We've got uh, Mike Kellum with us, uh, who's a longtime member and, and doctor in our congregation. Uh, Angie Store, who's been a part of our church for what is it about three years now, Angie? Is three years. Right? Yep. Okay. And then Caroline Robertson also, who's been a part of our church family for a couple of years off and on, would you say? Yeah. Uh, you may know uh, Jim and Kathy Robertson, who are uh, Caroline's parents that are regular parts of our church. And Caroline's been away to school and is now living here in the area. So I'm grateful to have each of you all on. Thanks for, for joining us uh, this evening. I know we've got a lot of questions and thoughts about the medical community. We're hearing things from... Uh, all kinds of places, news sources and other things. We're certainly concerned for you all and grateful for the role you're playing. Uh, we see the presence of Jesus in you. And that's obviously true in your profession uh, at all times, but it's probably increasingly so at this time. And so I just want to, first of all, just express our gratitude for, for the different roles you're playing. But I wanted to start by just kind of asking the question uh, to each of you um, and to start however y'all would like. Um, why don't we start with Angie, actually? Why don't we do that? And uh, just introduce yourself and let us know what is it that you normally do uh, as a profession and how, if any, has that changed uh, over the past month or so as uh, this COVID-19 virus pandemic has, has been occurring. So Angie, would you kick us off? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I'm an OBGYN and uh, before um, COVID kind of took over, uh, I would see probably 20 to 24 patients in a day and um, sometimes a little bit more. Um, I do predominantly GYN and less OB, and um, I take care of a lot of kind of chronic pain patients. Um, when COVID kind of started happening, it, it kind of just upended our whole world, honestly. Um, our patient volumes dropped by about 50%. We're um, rescheduling all non-essential visits. Um, patients that have appointments that need to be kept for one reason or another, um, you know, particular problem visits and whatnot, a lot of it we're doing via telemed. Most um, practices set up telemedicine over about a six month period. It took us about uh, six minutes to get hmm. telemedicine going. Like seriously, I looked into it, set it up and used it on a patient about 30 minutes after I put it onto my computer. Um, it worked, which was good, but that's been kind of like a, a big upheaval. Um, we unfortunately just today had to cut hours for our staff because we're not seeing enough patients to make the overhead right now. Um, well, thank you very much for Angie for sharing some of that and I appreciate what you're doing. Caroline, would you share uh, what what you do and then what it's looked like the last month for you? Yeah, so I work, um, I'm a registered nurse at Children's Health in Dallas. Um, so I'm normally on, well, I'm still am, on the GI liver transplant floor. So we take kids pre and post transplant. So I take care of them um, when they're in liver failure and they're in need of a new liver. And then we get them right after transplant. And then we get them if they're sick like a few years down the road and they come back to us. And so um, it's been kind of thankfully quiet on my unit specifically because we are on a transplant floor. Um, however, we do get the COVID kid rule outs that we call them, like they're ruling out if they have COVID, if they've had a liver transplant in the past. So if they have any history of liver transplant and they have any symptoms of COVID, they do come to our unit. And that's been kind of 
eerie for sure. It's been very nerve wracking. Um, how has it changed? A lot of our elective surgeries have as well been postponed and they've been um, scheduled for later dates. So our census has been low. A lot of us have been getting canceled, which is not terrible. <laughs> but um, as of like going into work, we have to fill out a form um, prior to leaving and we have to say if we had any new symptoms we had to we have checkpoints throughout the hospital we have to get our temperature taken um and now they just implemented that we have to wear a mask at all times and so it's just like a kind of an eerie process of going to work every day wow yeah well, we're hearing reports and so it's really good to hear from the kind of from y'all particularly how is this affecting you and so thanks for sharing that mike what about you and your practice yeah, my situation is pretty similar to Angie's, as she was saying. We're, we're probably down less than 50% in volume because of routine things being canceled. And, you know, my practice is a, is a mixture of health maintenance where we do physicals, uh, you know, chronic medication checks for people with high blood pressure and diabetes and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then acute care, which has been a challenge in and of itself because, you know, we uh, have had to be careful about how we manage our folks that have symptoms that could possibly be uh, COVID-19. So we had to go through a quick process of figuring out, okay, how do we take care of our patients uh, and protect our staff and those that are you know, working on the front line with as much precautions as we can. And especially in the beginning, it was uh, very frustrating because we didn't have any way of you know, testing people to figure that out. And you had kind of had two choices. You, you stayed home and took care of yourself if you thought you might have those uh, COVID-19 symptoms or if you got sick enough to where you thought you might need to be in the hospital, then you could go to the emergency room. And that was kind of our choices, you know. Initially, we uh, uh, you know, saw some folks that were having upper respiratory symptoms, but then it became pretty obvious that, that was gonna be a risk for, for our, our office. And I think in a little bit, I can share more about some of those experiences that we've had when we talk about our fears and concerns. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, we quickly, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, heard about telemedicine, you know, kind of talked about it and I kind of poo pooed it cause you know, who needs that? We don't have to do that. And then I think in one day we all kind of realized, well, we're going to have to start doing that because, uh, there's folks that, you know, need some help and some things we can do to, uh, you know, help people with telemedicine. So we've been doing, uh, I'd say probably two thirds to three fourths of my visits now are telemedicine and. 25 to 30 percent are in person things that I just can't do over the phone and we have folks come in as Caroline was saying we uh, just started a policy of everybody in the office wearing masks you know from any public areas at all so that's interesting those masks get really stuffy after a while you know <laughs> I saw a picture uh, earlier this week of a woman named Kim Langford whose uh, husband I think is a professor at Oklahoma Christian and uh, she's opted to go from Oklahoma to New York City. And uh, I was actually watching one of the news broadcasts and saw her picture on there and saw an article that had been written in the Oklahoma newspaper and just saw, yeah, those masks. It was a picture of her after she'd taken that mask off. And so a lot of us have seen all that's going on. I, I, you know, you mentioned kind of a segue, I guess, into the next question I wanted to ask, which is what have been one of those moments? Uh, and I'll start back with you, Mike, since you kind of got into this, where fear and anxiety, uh, you notice, is really taking uh, control or at least had a moment, if not maybe more, more than that. Would right, you share right. a, a moment we, like that? Uh, uh, you know, you know, it was kind of all an academic exercise at first because, you know, there wasn't any cases around or anything like that. But then uh, we had one patient that came in that had some, you know, vague symptoms it had been going on for a while. And so I wasn't overly concerned. Uh, we did wear masks while we were together and, and that sort of thing. And then she ended up going on to be tested uh, the day after I saw her. And then she, that was, a, ended up being a Friday and she called on Monday that said she had tested positive for COVID-19. So that was my first contact with a patient that actually had been positive. And so it just sort of becomes a reality at that point. Like, Oh, wow. We just had someone with COVID-19 in our office and we all, you know, dealt with it. Thankfully, we were following, you know, pretty good protocol. We didn't have total PPE on and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, everybody was wearing masks and stuff. And so that's when it really kind of, you know, hit home that, okay, we are dealing with this. And there are those folks in our community 
Um, to my knowledge, I've only had two patients that have been positive that I've been in direct contact with since this started. Uh, in the last week or so, we've been having an ability to uh, send people to a testing center where they can do a drive-through testing. And so that's been a real you know, plus for our folks. At least they can go find out if they want to. But yeah, there was that little uh, jolt of concern when you realize that, okay, here we go. This is you know, what we were expecting, but it's actually uh, come to a reality. Yeah. Can't imagine that, it, that experience, but I know that's a reality for so many right now. And in your profession. Caroline, what about you? Uh, fear and anxiety, how has that played a role over the last few weeks? So um, about a month before this kind of all peaked, I actually moved out of my parents' home. I was living at home, and so I moved to Dallas to be closer to the hospital. And I think um, as people became, like, started to take it more seriously and things became a little bit more worse and um, it became more real, I think it kind of hit me more like, okay, like I'm not going to see my family for a while. I'm not going to, I'm going to be by myself. I have to go to work. This is, this, I took an oath. I, I'm on, you know, I, this is my duty to go. And it's like, for a long time, I was like, I don't have the luxury of staying at home and working from home. And my job is I'm, I'm in the hospital. I'm in the patient setting. And it, it really um, made me look internally of why I chose nursing and why I chose this profession and to really, um, stay true to that calling. But during that time, it was just like that fear and anxiety of potentially exposing my family, potentially being alone for an un unknown amount of time um, was very, was very scary. So. Uh, Angie, what about for you? How has that uh, manifest itself in your life? Ooh, um, initially, it, again, it was kind of sort of a, a an intellectual pursuit, looking into literature and kind of getting an idea of what was going on. And then as um, I joined a couple of Facebook groups for physicians, international Facebook groups, and was seeing what was going on in Italy where um, dermatologists and psychiatrists were being pulled to work in COVID units. At that point, I started panicking, not because of being exposed. I fully assume at this point that I've been exposed, but because I haven't run a vent in 14 years, I don't know how to manage these patients and the idea of being called in to take care of patients that I don't feel I'm qualified to be taking care of absolutely terrifies me. Um, I, I don't want to do something wrong and accidentally kill somebody that's, you know, got a diagnosis that I know so little about, we all do, and that I, I don't know how to, to manage these patients. But, you know, in places like Italy, all of the ICU docs were sick. And they were pulling in whoever could cover. And I mean, I'm an OBGYN. I don't do that kind of intensive medicine. And so that, that really was what panicked me for the longest time. And eventually, I know this sounds really silly, but my husband had to start taking my phone away at night because I was reading up on ICU journals and I, I couldn't sleep. Like I would stay up until two and three o'clock in the morning researching how to run vents, vent settings, and how to you know manage patients that are sedated, how to do sedation protocols. And it was very anxiety provoking. Um, and now we're getting to the point where I have friends in New York City that are pediatricians that are running ICU. Wow. Well, I, I've noticed a lot of people um, that I've been talking to other ministers and friends that have talked about trouble sleeping, uh, but it's a different level when you're thinking about the kind of realities y'all are facing. So uh, I, I appreciate that. That's one prayer uh, we can be lifting up for you is just the rest and sleep. Uh, and management of that. Um, I, I mentioned this in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, and I'm trying to remember the source of it, but um, I think it was Mr. Rogers talked about his mom. And that when there were tragedies, she told him to look where the helpers are. Um, and so as a helper yourself, <laughs> it's one of those that's uh, keeping your oath, as Caroline said a moment ago. And we'll start with Caroline this time. Um, tell about a moment where you have seen God at work in the midst of all this, that you, you, uh, you would say, yeah, God, I see God's hand, even though I know this is a challenging time and we're not sure where this all is headed. Sure. Yeah, I think um, it's just been amazing to see the most random people that I've never even met just stop and say thank you. And I remember I was leaving for work one evening and someone um, stopped me in my apartment complex and said, you know, thank you. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And it just it took me a minute to like realize 
wait, what, what are you saying? And I was in my scrubs and it, and I realized what he was saying. And he just said, you know, I, I couldn't do this and, and thank you. And it's, it kind of just took me back and it's saying like, you know, I don't necessarily want to, to do this, but I'm going to do this, you know? And it took me a minute to just, to just realize like, this is, this is what I'm doing. And, um, but it was just cool to see all these people just really encourage every, all health professionals, doctors, nurses, techs, respiratory therapists, everyone. And um, whether it's just an encouraging text message, a thank you, um, coffee money, anything. Like it's just so many people have just been so uplifting um, throughout this scary time for sure. Wow. Even something as simple as wearing scrubs, right? Uh, right. Something that <laughs> yeah. We often forget in these times. Yeah. What about you, Mike? Uh, a, a God moment you've seen. Yeah, as I thought about that, uh, a couple of things. Certainly, as Caroline was saying, I've had so many outpourings of um, same folks who were praying for us and and gratefulness for doing what we do, and 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 those have been very encouraging, and I felt that uh, very much as well. Um, we've had several folks that have uh, donated masks and supplies to us. You know, some of the N95s that we all know so well. Um, have come in from folks that you know wanted to help out in whatever way they could so that was really appreciated and then I just had to say to for um, you know when we first um, started making plans for this with our staff and we have I think about 25 nurses and x-ray technician lab technicians front office receptionists all those sort of things and and six docs in our office and we all just kind of had a big powwow and sat down and sort of went through protocols and what we're going to do. But I was just so thankful that everyone there um, was on board. You know, we didn't have anybody saying like, eh, I'm out, you know, with this. I'm just didn't sign up for this. All of our staff just came together and said, OK, we'll do this. We'll watch each other's back and, 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 and get through this. And I was just, you know, really thankful for for the spirit that everyone had because you know a lot of these folks are single moms and have to figure out what to do with their kids and the school's out and if they get sick what happens to them and a lot of a lot of folks that are really putting a lot on their line even more so than I would say that I have and um, so that was a blessing that I was very much thankful for. Yeah thanks for that Mike. What about you Angie? Where have you seen God at, at work? Uh, do you have a moment that, that you can remember? Yeah, I've got a couple. Um, unfortunately, my my MA has three kids that are all um, special learning abilities and is a single mom. And three weeks ago, on a dime on Friday, said, I'm not going to be able to come back on Monday. We don't have anybody to care for the kids or help them with their schoolwork. And um, I prayed about it. And I was like, okay, I tried not to panic because I had, you know, patients on Monday and we hadn't started really thinning the schedule all that out at that point. Although it kind of um, organically happened. Some of the patients called in and wanted to be rescheduled, but I, within about four hours, was able to find an MA to replace her. And in that wow. instant, I mean, that would never happen otherwise. I mean, like you can imagine how difficult it is just to try and find somebody. Um, and she also, she had experience in very similar fields to what I do. It was a huge blessing. Um, and that was definitely a God moment um, and took a lot of my anxiety off of my plate that that weekend. Um, and then the other thing is that um, there have been multiple people from church that have texted and asked, is there anything we can do for you? Is there anything we can help you with? Um, and you know, there was the, the day I had to start rescheduling all of these patients and was I, I was getting kind of frazzled. It was getting close to like, you know five or six o'clock and I wasn't sure how dinner was going to happen. Someone texted and she's like, what can I do to help? I was like, oh my gosh, if you could drop food off at my household right now, my husband's had the kids by himself all day and was expecting me to bring home food. I was going to pick it up on the way home and I, I don't know when I'm going to get there. And someone from church dropped food off at our house. Um, and that, that was huge. Um, we've been sent gift cards via email from, patients that are saying, you know, just thinking about you wanting to make sure you're okay and sending a gift card for, you know, Chipotle. It's been really encouraging. Well, that's encouraging to hear those things in the midst of all this, because uh, it, it's encouraging to see you all in the ways you're serving, but to see people serving you as well. Just an encouragement how the body of Christ and uh, people in general, even apartment uh, neighbors can be a blessing in this season. 
What, uh, let's start with, with you, Mike, on this one. What Bible verse uh, or spiritual practice uh, or meditation technique, whatever it may be that's keeping you centered right now that you're coming back to over and over again or is a blessing to you right now? I'd love to hear that. Well, the first thing that uh, comes to my mind that's really been a, a blessing in my life, we started before this whole process got started. You know, uh, Gaynell and I started uh, decided to do a uh, podcast daily Bible reading to, to go through the Bible. And I have to confess, there's been many years that I've really tried to do that. And, you know, I get to uh, Deuteronomy and Numbers and it just kind of fades out after that. <laughs> um, so this has been a really good one that we've really enjoyed. Uh and so we've got family and friends that are doing this together. And so we, you know, kind of discuss things and talk about things. And, and uh, this uh, person that does the podcast has really, uh, you know, kind of motivated us to stay with it. And she'll say things like, I know this is going to be a slog today. And you got to just get through all these repetitive, you know, genealogies or roll calls or, you know, all the rules that you just, you know, and she, she keeps, her main thing is just look look for what God is doing in this. You know, look for your God shot. She says every day you try to find a, a God shot, and and that really has kind of changed my attitude. And and um, so usually, oftentimes going to work or coming home, I I'll, I'll listen to the podcast. You know, on in my car, and uh, sometimes I read the Bible scriptures, and sometimes I listen to them on the uh, new version. You know, the same thing that we use at church, and so. Um, I didn't realize at the time, you know, what a uh, anchor that was going to be for me and through all this, but it's uh, really been a great experience. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, it's amazing how our practices, I guess we're preparing in our spiritual lives for, uh, for what we, uh, we don't know what basically what we're preparing for. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we can build that practice, then we're ready in the moments that we're not sure what we would do otherwise. And so that's a, that's a great example, I think. Caroline, what about for you? What, uh, what spiritual practice or Bible verse or other rhythm of your life has really kept you sane in the midst of this season? Yeah, I think for me, I've just been trying to fill my quiet time with a lot of worship music and just um, not staying on the news because it's so easy just to like keep watching, keep watching and get so nervous. But um, a song in particular that has been really helpful through this process, it's um it's called remember and I, I don't remember the artist of it but in in the song one of the lyrics says um oh my soul remember who you're talking to it's the only one that death bows to and it was just i don't know that really spoke um to me throughout this whole time is that the death bows to god and and it has no victory over us and um that's been very, I've just clung to that through this whole process of when I'm nervous or when I'm scared and anxious, I just play that song or I remember that, that, um, those lyrics. And also it's just being like intentional with just talking to people. It's so easy to feel isolated during this time and, and to feel alone, but it's just being intentional with talking to your friends, your family. Um, and that's really helped as well. That's great. We may have to pay attention to that song to having a future worship service. That sounds like a great one. Like this Sunday, I'm going to be uh, on Easter preaching through First Corinthians 15. And mm -hmm. there's that line uh, at the end of that chapter about, you know, where, O oh, death is your victory, where, O oh, death is your sting. And well, it sounds naive almost in a way uh, in light of what we're facing in the numbers. But uh, there's a reality to that, that God is victor over death, um, even in this difficult season. And so I appreciate that that uh, encouragement. So add that to your <laughs> your uh, song list if uh, you're not listening to it right now. Uh, Angie, what about you? A spiritual practice or rhythm or anything that's kept you sane in this season, um, connecting to God or otherwise? Well, there's probably been two big things that I could think of that have kind of kept me centered. One of these is that over the last year or so, God has asked Regan and I to do a lot of things that were out of our comfort zone. And every time we complied, a blessing of some nature was on the backside. Sometimes it was, he asked us, you know, to give a lot of money. There was a need and we're like, you know what, we're just going to do it. We'll trust that God will take care of it. And on the back end, you know, sometimes there was a financial benefit for us, you know, all of a sudden a check came in that we weren't expecting. Um, or, you know, there's been other times where we've been asked to go out of our way to do something that took time or that took effort or that put us just really in an uncomfortable position um, in in a personal way. And God has always come back and said, Hey, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. 
And so it's been a lot easier as this has kind of played out and there's been some financial concerns. Am I going to be able to keep my employer employees paid? Am I going to need to furlough anybody? Is this going to, you know, and I, I just, all of that, I, I keep remembering God has been so faithful asking us to do stuff we were really uncomfortable with this last year. He will continue to take care of it. Um, the other thing is actually a verse that you uh, brought up this week in service that has been playing over and over and over in my mind. A lot of my colleagues um, are, are very scared right now about dying. Um, there's actually several different attorneys in the area that are providing free services for wills and for power of attorney and things that a lot of us at our age don't necessarily think about. Um, because I faced death three years ago, four years ago now, oh gracious, four years ago um, when I had a pulmonary embolism and ought to have died based on medical circumstances and God brought me through that. Um, we already had all that stuff done and this verse was with me then at that time too and it, it keeps coming back up is to live as Christ and to die as gain. And some of my, even my Christian friends that are doctors and are, are scared of dying they're like, what am I, what's going to happen to my husband? What's going to happen to my kids? What, you know, and I keep telling myself to live as Christ, to die as gain. If he asks me to give my life in the fight of this virus, I will happily do so. My husband and my children will be taken care of. Wow. I, I actually had a Zoom last week. And uh, one of the practices I talked about that may be helpful is uh, breath prayer um, or kind of centering meditation prayer, uh, trying to listen more to God rather than just speaking, uh, which both are needed. But uh, in that breath prayer, having a phrase that we breathe in and having a praise, phrase that we breathe out, kind of regulating our breathing as we pray to God as well, that has all kinds of benefits for us, as you all know. And uh, that would be an interesting prayer for us to, to, to practice as well, would be to live as Christ, to die as gain, being those phrases. So just a reminder to those of you that are, are checking in. I'm looking around the room and I'm noticing several, uh, I'm thinking about James Voss, who's connected here and just want you to know we're praying for you, James. And James has talked about, you know, the hospital and how different an experience that has been for them to be there. I'm, I'm noticing Cheryl Patton's connected on too. And her daughter, Megan is uh, in a hospital right now and, and serving in Abilene. And so I know that there are people that are glued here uh, for all kinds of reasons, but I noticed a couple who are here uh, that are really being affected in, in positive ways as a result of the medical community and some are serving in that fashion. They're affected many of these families in many of the ways that you are. And so, grateful for your time with us today. Um, one thing I want to say to those who are in the room with us right now, if you do have a question that you're thinking of that you'd like for us to pass on uh, to these three, there's a chat box that hopefully you can pull up on the uh, bottom of your screen. If you scroll down and click the chat uh, uh, button there, tab there, should pull up a window that if you have a question, feel free to ask those. And we may have time for, for one or two of those uh, after this one. But I wanted to ask, how can people help uh, and support you and other health professionals in the season. We've already heard some examples of that, just comments in passing, gift cards that have been given, uh, other suggestions that you all have mentioned, but what's most beneficial and the greatest blessing in this season? Uh, Angie, could we start with you? What, what would you share? Sure. Um, prayer, prayer, and more prayer. Um, I think prayers for things like sanity, uh, prayers for sleep, because those two things are in short supply in the medical communities right now. Um, prayers for patients to get well quickly. Uh, pray prayers for a, a vaccine. I, I, I know it seems silly, but um, that, that's one of the few things that's going to stop this, is if a vaccine can be developed and, and appropriately distributed. Um, I, I think those that still may have some personal protective equipment hanging out in their garage from a previous painting expedition or whatnot, being able to donate that. I finally got a hold of an N95 mask a week ago and I've been using it for a week. <laughs> um, I was able to get some, uh, some more on Saturday from the Collin County Medical Society. So I have a couple of them now, but my staff are using them because um, we're finding in the OB community when uh, in places like New York where they're testing asymptomatic patients, everybody that's walking into labor and delivery units that up to 70% are positive and asymptomatic. So we're assuming in an area that's less populated um, per capita than New York City that maybe up to 30% of our patients are positive and we don't know it. So just having things like an N95 mask. If you guys have any of that stuff at home and are willing to donate, that would be incredibly helpful. But I think prayers more than anything right now. Thanks, Angie. What about you, Mike? 
Yeah, again, pretty much like as I say, we just really appreciate just the comments and prayers, uh, you know, just for God's uh, shield to be about this whole process and um, definitely uh, continue social distancing. So, you know, it's kind of, let's see if we can keep this virus down and keep it from spreading and avoid the, the high peak and that will be very helpful. Um, yeah, I would just echo everything that Angie said. Great, thanks Mike. What about you, Carolyn? Yeah, I definitely agree, just prayers and support um, and to stay home. I know it's so hard to stay home and um, to wash your hands, please. <laughs> um, but also just not to fall into the panic of all of this. I know it's so unnerving and so uneasy and it, it's so easy to do that. And I, I've been there myself, but um, to know that this will end and that it's not going to last forever um but to not fall into the panic too but mainly it's just prayers and um that's the greatest thing right now well i appreciate the time you all have given us um i don't notice right now any questions in our chat box and so i want to uh, end with a time of prayer uh for the three of you all and you representative of others in our congregation and in our community around the country and around the world that are uh taking the role you're taking. There was a book that I read a few years ago by John Ortberg, who is this man that talks about Jesus. And one of the questions in that book that was really interesting was uh, if you were to take Jesus and his movement and everything Jesus has affected out of our world, um, like with a magnet, you were to take all the traces of effect of the Jesus movement, the kingdom of God, uh, what would be different? And it was remarkable as I read that book, how many phases of society would be different. And one of those phases that John Ortberg talks about is the medical community, the hospitals were a result of the Christian community responding to the plagues that I mentioned a few weeks ago and uh, setting up hospitals, Catholic organizations and other churches that did that early on. And uh, so you're representative of a uh, tradition of the Christian community that's been willing to say yes out of what you, some of you talked about earlier, that the fact that the live is Christ and die is gain. If we believe that with all of our hearts, fear and anxiety can creep in. Uh, but God can still be at work and we have a confidence of where we end up, even if the worst happens as we imagine it here. And so once you know, we're praying for your families. We're praying for you as individuals. We're grateful in so many ways for the services you all are providing. You are showing us the presence of Jesus. And uh, so we want to lift up prayer as we close our time uh, on this Zoom call today. God, I, I lift up prayers right now on behalf of Angie and Caroline and Mike. And I know there are others in our congregation as well that serve in uh, essential uh, uh, capacities. And that's not just in hospitals, God, it's all over the place. As we look around us, we see those that are still going to work and are not able to uh, shelter at home as so many of us take for granted that we can. And what seems like a challenge right now to us is a great blessing that we can protect ourselves in that way. But God, there's nothing we can do. We're not in control of this. Uh, only you are the one who can be in control and can bring healing. And you use uh, people who've gone to school and have used their uh, logic and the gifts you've given them, God, uh, those who are looking for vaccines and cures. And uh, so, God, I give you thanks for what you have implanted in each and every human being out there, not just those who are Christians, but everyone who has a gift to give has been given that gift from you. And so, God, in this season, I just ask that you would uh, expand their gifts and multiply them, that there'd be surprising, uh, uh, incredible moments where we get to testify to your goodness and your glory through this. I pray for protection over those who are serving as nurses and doctors and uh, cleanup crews in hospitals and administrators, all those who are causing the medical community to continue on in research facilities. And God, we pray for that cure to happen, as Angie mentioned, uh, that that vaccine can come or whatever's needed can come so that around the world we can see uh, a flattening of the curve and an elimination of this disease. I think back to uh, the Ebola crisis and Kim Brantley that I mentioned this last week in the sermon and just in awe of the ways that he put his life on the line and the way you got glory for that. So I pray that through uh, these three and so many others, God, that you would get the glory for what they're doing and that you would bless them with sleep and with rest and uh, with all that they need to continue the task that they're doing. And uh, God, we lift this up all in the name of Jesus, who is the great physician. Amen.